today, as you all know, uh, we're going to be going through the climate action simulation game. Um, and um, let me just do a quick run through. So climate action simulation, this was developed uh, by us at Climate Interactive. Um, here on the team today is me, Ellie Johnston. I'm the climate and energy lead at Climate Interactive. Um, Janet Tchaikovsky is here, and as well as Caroline Reed. We're both program associates here on our team. And you all, I know, have been in touch with maybe either one or both of them uh, before. So uh, they'll be supporting in different ways as we go through the game. Uh, the ESB Business School, as well as the UMass Lowell Climate Change Initiative and the MIT um, Sustainability Initiative all chipped in and helped out with the development of the climate action simulation. Today, we're using Zoom. Um, so, which enables us to have breakout rooms and some other fun features. A few notes, uh, do be mindful of whether you're, you are muted or unmuted um, and take that into consideration. In a little bit, we will offer virtual backgrounds. This is a feature that um, some computers can handle and if your computer has that uh, capability, we encourage you to do, use a virtual background. We'll say more later. Um, and then there is the chat box. So you can chat with us on the team as well as anyone else uh, participating here in the climate action simulation through the chat there at the bottom. And welcome everyone. And if you want, you can chat in your name and where you're coming from just to get us all started uh, while I'm finishing these, going through this introduction. Um, when we go into the breakout rooms, I'll, I'll try and remember to repeat this as well, but um, at the top of the breakout room, you can keep an eye out for a message. We will send in different messages um, when the breakout rooms happen. Uh, you can also ask for help. Um, if you have a question for us and we're not in the breakout room, uh, that's a feature. And you can also leave the breakout room and come visit us. So just note a few, a few of these things and where they're located on the Zoom interface. We can remind you as well um, as we go through. So uh, I'll do some introductory remarks and then we'll uh, hear from the UN Secretary General who's making an appearance today uh, for the welcoming of our climate action simulation. Then we'll go into negotiation rounds and then we'll conclude uh, with a debrief. So just a little bit of background on what we're up to. Uh, the climate action simulation is a group role play game uh, that explores the solutions for addressing climate change. We're gonna be using real data, a computer simulator, inroads um, for this kind of mock UN exercise. Uh, inroads, the tool will be that we will use. I know um, some of you, many of you all are very familiar with inroads. Um, so we'll be using that to ground the pledges that you all in your roles uh, will be proposing. So the way this works is that global leaders from sectors across business, government, and civil society will gather to negotiate as climate solutions plan that limits warming to less than two degrees, and ideally uh, uh, close to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Um, so again, our goal, as it's stated in the, the Paris Agreement, is to limit global warming to less than two degrees. Um, the groups that we have today, and uh, soon Caroline is working to break you all into those different groups, and so you'll figure out which group you have been assigned to and get to meet your fellow team members. Uh, the first group we have will, will be the conventional energy group. This uh, is a group representing the largest energy suppliers in the world, coal, oil, gas, nuclear, and electric utility companies. Uh, then we have the clean tech group. So you, you all will be representing the emerging and quickly growing field of renewable energy technologies, energy storage, energy efficiency, green building, and as well as like tech, things like technological carbon removal. Then we'll have another group representing industry and commerce, really focused on the, uh, the, the consumers of energy around the world, the manufacturing companies, the automakers, construction, industrial machinery, uh, and all the different consumer products that use energy around our world. The next group will, will be the land, agriculture, and forestry group. So this will be a global alliance of both food and agricultural companies, as well as large landholders, uh, farmer advocacy groups, logging companies, and also land conservation groups. And then a, 
finally, there'll be, uh, excuse me, not finally, we have another group, uh, but we'll have our civil society groups, the Climate Justice Hawks. These are our leading environmental nonprofits, our grassroots and youth climate movements that are calling for uh, bold action and uh, are just have been relentless in keeping, keeping governments and businesses on track towards addressing climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, the last group is a, is a governmental group, our world governments group. So these are government leaders from around the world representing developed countries, rapidly developing countries and small island nations. Um, so together, the these six groups will come together and negotiate and make proposals for a global agreement. Um, at this point, Caroline, are we ready to um, turn people into their breakout rooms? Do you have those set up at this point? Uh, yes, it should be just about ready if you'll give me one second and then I'll send the document and the chat. Great. So what Caroline is going to do is she's going to send you all a Google spreadsheet and uh, hopefully everyone is able to access that spreadsheet and open it up. And when you open it up, you'll see which groups you have been, been you, which group you are assigned to and you will find hyperlinks to uh, the briefing statement as well as to uh, the virtual background that um, you are welcome to use if, if you want within Zoom here. Um, and then we will send you all into the breakout groups for, I would say, a, a, maybe a little over five minutes, uh, give you all a chance to say hello to your group members, but also access those documents and uh, review them quickly um, before, we, we, before we hear from the UN Secretary General. Remain orderly and please uh, respect the silence of the room until you are called on to speak. Thank you all for coming here. Uh, we are so pleased to welcome you to these chambers today. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our UN Secretary General to give her opening remarks. Delegates, it is a pleasure to be in your presence today. I know many of you all are uh, joining us from all corners of the world. Uh, and of course, these are difficult times that we face. Uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic um, that is ravaging our world, creating all kinds of uncertainty amidst already so many other critical challenges we face. Of course, the reason why we are gathering here today is this topic of climate change. Our world is continuing to warm every year in spite of decades of uh, negotiations and actions. Uh, in 2015, we passed the Paris Climate Agreement. Thank you all to those of you who were part of that process. It was a landmark achievement and uh, it continues to be the bar to which we uh, strive to, to take action. And that goal in the Paris Climate Agreement is to limit warming to well below two degrees and aim towards 1.5. That is your charge today, delegates, uh, and we ask you to take that absolutely seriously. Um, the world has never been warmer uh, as, we, uh, as we experience all of the impacts. I'm gonna show you all some of the, the science. I know many of you all are well aware of this. This is top of your mind and I really appreciate uh, the commitment that you all have brought to this process to taking climate action generally. Um, it, the, the people at the NOAA Mauna Loa Observatory out in Hawaii in the United States have been measuring the level of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere for the last uh, 60 plus years. And as you can see, their measurements lead us to where we are today at 417 parts per million of CO2. This is a steady climb over the last uh, over half century. But to put this into context, delegates, this, this global carbon dioxide uh, level of rise is higher than it has been in hundreds of thousands of years. And recent research suggests that it may be higher than it has been in 3 million years. Uh, you know, it, the entire existence of humanity has not experienced carbon dioxide levels at this at the level that we are experiencing right now at this very moment. 
a significant part of where these carbon dioxide emissions comes from is from our burning of fossil fuels, uh, from cars, from trucks, and also from our land use. Um, you all, uh, in partnership with me, my team within the United Nations, as well as many businesses, the civil society, many of you all that are representing here today, we need to come together and figure out what we can do collectively to address this, to mitigate it, and to take action. These high levels of carbon dioxide, they're leading to global temperature rise. Already we see one degree of warming globally. Uh, this equates to almost two degrees uh, of temperature change in Fahrenheit and one degree in degrees Celsius. The sources of this, as I mentioned, fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas, as well as land use change. We must take this absolutely seriously. Just yesterday, yesterday, in the BBC, they reported that the Arctic Circle is seeing its highest ever recorded temperatures. Uh, this follows on a study that came out earlier this last week where we found that climate change is tied to pregnancy risk affecting black mothers in the United States most. Um, across the world, extreme heat is devastating communities worldwide. Um, when we look at the, the economic toll from this, climate-related disasters have cost the world over $650 billion uh, just in, in, in recent years. This, the, these totals of damages could, could add up into the trillions uh, by 2040, accor according to my researchers here within the United Nations. That is absolutely astounding, and we can prevent that. We are already seeing devastating economic toll from the pandemic, and to have climate change added on top of that we must think about how we can address these, these challenges simultaneously. Delegates, uh, if we don't take action, we're on a track towards uh, where we could end up towards as much as 4.1 degrees Celsius by the end of the century in terms of temperature change. Let me tell you, this would be absolutely devastating. What does four plus degrees uh, Celsius of warming mean? Well, that could be, mean that long term we would see multimeter sea level rise. Think about the dependence of our economies, how many people we know and are tied to that live in coastal communities. Uh, many of you sitting in this room too. Uh, we could also see a widespread increase in the frequency of drought. Already across the world, uh, we see pockets where just drought is ravaging communities. And this is only with one degree of temperature change. Desertification in Mediterranean Europe, increase in frequent heat waves and floods, and long-term warming that could carry us well above four degrees by in, 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 in many centuries to millennia. This we can't, we can't handle. And I know many of you all are well aware of what's at stake. You have committed yourselves to taking action. Um, and I know also some of you all are new to the table. I am, I'm encouraged that we have representatives from the conventional energy groups um, here today who are finally coming to the table after many years of, of, of not willing to engage in this conversation. That is a landmark achievement and I wanna thank you all for being here. Um, and many of you all, our civil society groups have been hard at work for this for years. So our goal today is to limit warming to less than two degrees and uh, aim as close to 1.5. We're going to be using a simulator provided by the team at Climate Interactive and MIT to, to test the policies that you all propose and to explore the, 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 the outcomes from that. The way this process will work is that uh, you all will have a chance to meet in your delegations. You can come up with your um, objectives as a delegation. And then when you return, um, you will have a chance to present what your policies are. So in this time, in which you have some time to break out and meet with your team, identify uh, the, act, the kinds of actions that you, that you want to take and what your overall strategy will be within this negotiation exercise. Um, you all will have access to the one-page guide to the control panel. This is provided as a way to help you um, get a sense for all of the different policies that uh, we could potentially explore today. Within your teams, you may propose any kind of policy you would like um, across the suite of actions. You can add a new solution. And I also will note that you can remove solutions too, or remove actions that you don't think are solutions uh, that, other, uh, that other groups propose. So consider that as you come up with your strategy, you can propose something or you can plan to block something and remove it. 
as you um, meet and as you're coming up with these actions that you want to take, um, discuss within your team uh, a couple of them. You will only be able to propose one action per round, but prepare two to three in case another group has already proposed an action or um, you all decide to shift strategy. Um, in addition to proposing an individual actions, I want you all to explain to us uh, to why you are taking that action, why this, this is your group's chosen method of, of moving forward, moving the needle on climate change, and explain to us how your group will make sure that vulnerable communities are not hurt by your proposal. So, much, uh, so many critical challenges we face today, and we need to make sure that the actions that we're taking don't exacerbate anything else out there. Um, so you all will be able to meet, and here's a few other questions. What is feasible to achieve your, your interest? How can you solve more than one critical problem with the solutions that you are, you're offering? And how can you ensure, of course, that vulnerable communities are not disproportionately affected by your proposal? From here, um, we will uh, hear from each group. You will have one minute to present. I'm going to be very strict about that. We have a very limited amount of time to work with today and a very big goal to achieve. I think we can do it. Um, and I trust and have lots of confidence in you all and the, uh, the, the bodies that, and institutions and companies that you all represent and what you bring to the table to, today. So I'm very excited about that. I am going to send you all into your uh, breakout rooms. Once again, come up with your strategy. You have about 10 to 15 minutes here and we will notify you uh, if you if there are any announcements, as well as if you have any questions for us um, as uh, the UN officials here, you can come out of your breakout room or ask for help and we will happily assist you and uh, clarify any, any questions that remain. Thank you and good luck. And I look forward to hearing the policies that you all have come up with. In this case, climate would be a co-benefit? It could be. <laughs> Um, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know the, I, I can't say to the, the relative impact in terms of uh, uh, how you compare health benefits to climate benefits in terms of what kind of scale that can you compare them? So I have a question for Farad and Prince. Um, obviously, the three of us know what's going on in uh, the United States, good or bad. Um, what do you feel, either of you or both of you, uh, I don't know if you're just observing or you're participating, but I'm assuming you're participating. And if you can give us your perspective from your, uh, where you live. Uh, thank you. Um, so um, uh, in Africa, generally, um, we won't uh, support any policy uh, touching on, uh, I think, uh, uh, considering emission reduction and things like that. We have um, um, smart agriculture um, in this area. What we can, um, if it comes to emission reduction, we'll go for abolition of industrial uh, production, either livestock or things like that. Um, and of course, we believe that um, um, large-scale uh, farming um, this is uh, the, the most uh, um, area sector that produces so much of uh, uh, the CGSCs. Um, while here in Africa, um, we, we go for the um, traditional ways of um, farming, uh, keeping livestock, and. Um, we, we do believe that uh, in, in areas where extensive farming is being practiced, we are going towards um, organic fertilizers, which do not also uh, compare to um, the, 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 the mechanization into the use of these fertilizers. So uh, I will support, I know, I know um, something like uh, afforestation and deforestation, they, they have little um, if you use the simulator, but these are the things that can, the little things that uh, African countries can start with. Great, very useful. 
I said uh, about the Iran, uh, they don't have any plan. The government don't have a good plan uh, to agriculture and uh, something uh, others. Uh, in the uh, 40 years, uh, the last 40 years, uh, we lost our uh, more than half our uh, more than half our uh, jungles and uh, about the agriculture uh, they don't have any <coughs> special plan and because of that um, the agricultures uh, may um, use the more water for the something like watermelon or other fruits or agricultures that they use the more water uh, but uh, the product is not good for the country and they don't uh, they can't buy it uh, to uh, the other countries uh, or the people of the country because of that the usage of the water and consumption is very high and the country now uh, has uh, many problems uh, about the water and uh, in the culture the iran uh, don't have any special plan and uh, very weak and the about the uh, uh, animals like cow that uh, products uh, the methane, um, we uh, don't have any good and special plan. And because of that, um, uh, all of the um, things that uh, can uh, product a cow or uh, another animals uh, very high in the Iran. And um, I can't say anything good about the agriculture land on anything else in the Iran. The deforestation is very high and uh, our frustration is uh, below the zero and they don't have anything to do that because of that. So could you say, so if you could, if you could point to one thing that you would suggest for Iran, what would it be in terms of the, this particular area? Uh, what uh, what we can do? Yeah. What what would you what would you suggest if there was one thing you could suggest for your country? What might be acceptable? Yeah. Uh, uh, here uh, has uh, many lands uh, for uh, administration and uh, many things uh, because the United Nations. Uh, pay the money to our country to administration because we have many lands uh, but uh, unfortunately here the deforestation is uh, uh, detained uh, detain. uh, but the administration uh, anyone uh, can uh, can't do anything for the administration but here we have many lands to administration and if we want and if we can, uh, we can uh, product, uh, we can uh, do some agriculture, and we can have frustration. So, uh, I would propose, and I don't know if they'll, uh, when we get back to general session, whether this will be viewed as a dual as opposed to singular suggestion. Um, if we can address methane, there'll be a rapid response. Afforestation is something that needs to be done at the same time because that won't kick in for several years. Um, so it's a combination of, of what can we do for an immediate response and then how do we make this a, a long-term uh, persistent response. Um, planting, you know, in this country that they, they're ref referring it to as a, the Trillion Tree Project. Yep. Um, that's going to take up a lot of a potential arable land. And um, so we would have to identify where we could best 
um, exploit that land resource for forestry, for trees, uh, and then recognize that we're looking at even with rapid growing trees, five, 10 years before we begin to see any significant impact. Um, whereas if we can couple that with uh, land use that reduces methane, and um, as Prince pointed out, if we can go with organic rather than chemical fertilizers, we could reduce the uh, uh, nitrous gases that are associated with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think then our sector can make uh, an, an important impact without negatively impacting the economy of our sector. So and can we can we speak to how any one of those particular actions has does do they have a disproportionately larger impacts on vulnerable groups? I would suggest the afforestation part probably does not. Um, I'm not sure about that, and maybe moving to more vegetarian diets, which are relatively more, less expensive, at least I think they are. Um, that's also another way that you can do it without impacting vulnerable groups too much. I was just th sort of thinking a little bit more broadly in terms of those, those various uh, actions. Sure. Yeah, I, I think, um, Stuart, I like the way your position is. First of all, I like the idea of sort of escalating the voice of our uh, Kenyan and Iranian colleagues here. Prince Papa is Kenya, right? Nairobi? Yep, yeah. yep, yep. So uh, to give them a voice in this forum, I think is hugely important. Stuart, I really like your kind of immediate term impact and then something that can sort of be sustained over time where the immediate term impact is some of the innovations around you know, organic fertilizer. As Prince Papa mentioned, um, what we feed our cows uh, as a second example do that stuff now and then maybe the afforestation program over time um, is, is the long, longer term sustaining aspect of the strategy. Afforestation is, is easy to speak to as a kind of a, a positive for local communities as long as the program involves those local communities, right? Um, with the management of the land, with the mm -hmm. deciding which land to use. Um, so I think afforestation is a, is a natural win for local communities provided that you know it's done in coordination with them so i think we got two minutes left how do we all feel about the the sort of twofold strategy that Stuart? i think we can give it a try i don't know if they'll let us so we need to just decide i think it's worth trying and we also need to to choose a speaker yep so if we're only permitted one what do we go with I would go with the methane. Uh, yeah, for immediate impact, it's uh, methane. So. so, so why don't we why don't we frame it as kind of innovations in agricultural sustainability? Because then we can do both organic fertilizer as well as you know more seaweed and the and the cows' diets and 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 whatever else, right? We don't need not limit it to one solution, right? Uh -huh. Okay, and uh, who's who who will be our speaker? back everyone. Uh, so I hope those were fruitful uh, negotiations that you all had. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the policies and proposals that you all have come up with. Um, at this point, what I'm going to do is call forth a representative from each group. Uh, there should just be one person presenting and you will have one minute to quickly share the one policy uh, that you want to propose us to add to our climate solutions platform that we're creating here today. And then uh, we will look at the impacts of that. And just before I call on everyone, I do want to show you all um, the simulator that we will be investigating these proposals uh, with today. It's called Inroads. It was built by the team at Climate Interactive and the MIT Sloan School of Management Sustainability Initiative. Um, so you're looking at inroads here. And on the left, I'm showing global sources of primary energy from the year 2000 out to 2100. This red line at the top represents our oil use over time, coal demand, 
then we have here in blue, natural gas. Uh, here in pink, this is bioenergy. Green, growing steadily throughout the century is renewable energy. And then we have nuclear and uh, the possibility of some new energy source emerging new tech, which is at zero currently. On the right, I'm showing greenhouse gas net emissions by gas. So here you see the different sources of, uh, of greenhouse gases. So we have at the bottom, the land use CO2 emissions in gray here, this big wedge representing our energy carbon dioxide emissions, the F gases, uh, the, our methane emissions, and as well as our nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, if we follow our baseline scenario that we're showing here, we lead to 4.1 degrees. Um, fortunately, I know that you all have come up with some proposals that can enable us to reach that goal of staying well below two degrees. Um, so why don't I begin with the group from, um, how about the clean tech group? Why don't you all start and um, share your proposal for what you think we should do as a first step uh, to taking action on climate change? Could I have the representative from the clean tech group either uh, come off of mute and introduce themselves or raise your hand or identify yourself? Uh, that would be me. I'm Barbara Moulton from the clean tech sector. And uh, our first proposal is to raise the carbon price. Uh, we like the suggestion put forward by Citizens Climate Lobby. It, it models uh, going up 10 to $15 a year th in, through the century. Great. And then, Barbara, were you able to identify some of the um, considerations that you all might take into account to avoid that vulnerable communities are not impacted by your specific policy? Why, yes. Uh, the policy would include uh, recycling the revenue from that uh, uh, carbon price back into the economy in the form of dividends so that that would cushion the public and particularly lower income groups from rising energy prices. It would also act as an economic stimulus. So it, it helps the economy at the same time. The proposal also includes a border carbon adjustment, which encourages the whole world to adopt this policy. It makes it more feasible. Great. Thank you, Barbara, from uh, the Clean Tech Industry Group. So what I'm going to do here, Barbara, I won't be able to take the very specific uh, policy you suggested, but why don't we start with just a carbon price of $100 per ton as, a, as an initial kind of uh, starting point. So I'm going to uh, adjust inroads to a $100 per ton carbon price. And I want you all, before I do that, to think about what impact you think it might have in terms of global temperature change um, here on the right in terms of the temperature. And also, what do you think is going to happen to specifically these the coal line here, the oil line, as well as the gas line. Um, so think about that. I'm gonna enter it in $100 a, car, a ton and see the impact there. Uh, let me replay that in case you didn't catch that. So you see here in particular our coal line coming down significantly uh, as well as gas and oil. And then over here, we're going from where we were where we had a steady rise in carbon dioxide, I mean, greenhouse gas emissions, and that's coming down and it's nearly plateaued through, through the end of the century there in terms of energy CO2 emissions. So uh, a strong first start as a policy. And now I wanna move on to the land and agriculture group and hear from you all in terms of a next, next step. Hi, this is Stuart, and um, in case my power goes out, uh, Prince Papa is going to uh, fill in for me. Um, we are supporting uh, the new technological advances in agriculture and land use, most specifically in influencing uh, methane production. Uh, we think that methane production will have the uh, most rapid uh, response. Uh, there's research that shows that uh, manipulating the diet of cattle can significantly decrease the amount of methane that's produced. Uh, coupled with that, if we're permitted, um, 
using more organic fertilizers rather than chemical fertilizers that will also influence the uh, nitrogen gases that uh, are volatilized off of the land. Great. Thank you, uh, land, agriculture, and forestry for that uh, initial proposal. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to adjust our agricultural and waste emissions, which will address that those methane emissions that Stuart described, as well as that nitrous oxide. So um, think about, you know, particularly here as I adjust this, watch what happens here on this right graph. And we're targeting this blue wedge of methane emissions and this smaller purple wedge of N2O emissions. N2O shows up a lot in our fertilizers and methane emissions in, uh, in raising cattle um, and then also the uh, rice patties. So I'm gonna move this down, uh, say 50% and uh, we will see the impact that that makes. So let me replay that in case you missed it. Um, so we were at 3.3 uh, degrees, but then that brought us down with um, slashing our methane emissions, adopting better um, agricultural practices, and reducing those emissions from industrial fertilizers. Thank you, Land and Agriculture, for this, uh, this, this proposal. Uh, may, much appreciated. May I, may I quickly add a co-benefit that sure, moving, to yes, organic, moving to organic fertilizers and organic farming uh, will have a health benefit for everyone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, um, next up, uh, let's hear from our conventional energy group. Is there a representative from conventional energy that uh, could? Yeah, hi. This is uh, Yuval from the uh, conventional energy group. And we were planning to, to really come here with, with you know, um, very generous offer to, to put a lot of money into uh, CCS in order to capture CO2 from the atmosphere and directly uh, combat climate change. But unfortunately, what happened here was that it was unacceptable. Uh, the, the carbon price that was put here is, is uh, not something that we can live with. And the, the main reason is not because we're worried about our our own uh, success. The reason is that if you put a price on carbon, um, it's the direct uh, result of that is going to be that the price of energy is going to go up. And when the price of energy goes up, a lot of people are going to get affected. A lot of communities that do not have uh, the, the, the uh, the, their budget is a lot of money from their budget is is dedicated to to energy and if the energy price of energy goes up they're going to have a lot of a hard time coping with that and if you look in the past year we saw a lot of unrest in in south america and we saw the protests the 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 um in in uh, france the the yellow vests it was all about the price of energy that went up. And this is gonna uh, create such an unrest in the world that, that this is not a good idea to do. Okay. So I'm gonna have to use my vote in order to cancel out the price on carbon. Okay. Um, thank, you thank you again for being again. here, Conventional Energy. Um, so conventional energy has, has requested that they are going to undo the carbon price that was proposed by the clean tech group. So I'm going to remove that. And you see um, that that does take us back a few steps. Um, yeah. Uh, well, that's unfortunate. Um, why don't we just keep moving here? Um, maybe there is a as a proposal from our industry and commerce group that can get us back on track. Industry and commerce, what do you have for us? Well, we're relieved that uh, those excessive uh, carbon prices have been removed because we're quite concerned about the cost of energy. But we're also quite motivated to meet the goals that you set before us today. 
Um, and we believe that one of the significant benefits uh, could be in improving energy efficiency in our buildings and industry at large. So we would like to see a significant improvement in energy efficiency in buildings and industry. And it's going to bring a number of benefits. It's going to reduce our costs uh, by not having to use as much energy, and that'll help us reduce the price of our products, make them more accessible to people in general. Also, some other benefits. Uh, uh, better insulated buildings, for example, are more comfortable in the winter and in the summer. Uh, so there's going to be some health benefits. There'll also be less uh, air pollution from less uh, energy production. So there's a number of health benefits uh, from improving energy efficiency. Um, and thirdly, uh, there's a lot of job creation that's associated with uh, energy efficiency programs. And so we see this as a real uh, co-benefit of uh, reducing our, our energy use within buildings and industry. One particular concern we have though is that often these programs are only accessible to homeowners rather than those who are renting homes uh, or to large businesses rather than some of the smaller businesses, especially those that are owned by newcomers or vulnerable communities. So we would want to see these energy efficiency programs rolled out in a way that does uh, take account of the needs of uh, those who don't have access to capital. But that's our, that's our proposal, is a dramatic if improvement in energy efficiency in buildings and industry. Great, thank you so much, Industry and Commerce. So I'm gonna adjust here the buildings and industry rapidly increase the energy efficiency of, 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 uh, of them. Um, so, and as I do that, I'm gonna point our attention to a, a slightly different graph. We're gonna look over here at energy demand. So currently we have this trajectory towards final energy consumption. Uh, as I move the buildings and industry slider for energy efficiency, think about what you expect uh, to happen to final energy consumption. So as I'm increasing it, you see here, uh, we're gonna highly increase our energy efficiency improvements uh, for buildings and industry. And you see what that does in terms of uh, energy consumption, it really levels it off. We're not uh, growing uh, the amount of ener the energy consumption and energy demand uh, is able to plateau and we're still able to do as much as we were before, but just more efficiently. Uh, thank you, Industry and Commerce for, for, for that proposal. Um, next up, let's hear from the um, World Governments Group. World Governments, uh, what, what kind of proposal do you have for us today? Uh Yes, can you uh, can you hear me okay? We can, thank you. Okay, very good. Well, what we'd like to do is uh, we would like to tackle uh, emissions uh, of methane directly into the atmosphere from industry, commerce, and extraction. And, uh, it, and these, uh, these emissions are caused by some of the richer countries who are more focused on natural gas uh, right now, there's, uh, there's not sufficient regulations to uh, control the waste and these uh, direct to atmospheric emissions. And we would like to tackle the non-agricultural emissions that, that are happening there. And we feel that these, uh, these uh, since this is uh, something that uh, attacks waste, uh, and, and it attacks it through regulation. We now have technologies that can, uh, you, that, that can more easily monitor uh, things like fracking wells that are uh, emitting methane and, and other, uh, other industrial processes that are emitting methane that we can, uh, we, we have the technology to, to uh, regulate that and monitor it much more effectively. So we'd like to tackle that. And we think that can be done Without uh, without harming uh, the citizens of different countries that are are uh, big natural gas producers. Great, thank you for that proposal, world government. So what I'm going to do is, uh, in addition to the action that we took on our agricultural and waste emissions, we're gonna we're gonna tackle these additional emissions, not the CO2 emissions uh, that occur when we burn um, things like natural gas. But, the, but some of the methane that is inherent to natural gas and is leaked out 
um, and is a part of natural gas production, as well as other emissions, more of those nitrous oxide emissions that show up in industrial uses. And the F gases are also included here. These are hydrofluorocarbons um, that appear in heavy industry and advanced technology, technology like the semiconductor industry, as well as in air conditioning and refrigeration. So as I move this, again, pay attention over here to these three gases on top of our energy CO2 emissions uh, and see how they're impact, impacted as well as our temperature change here. So I'm gonna move this down, reduce this as well to that uh, 50% and I'll hit replay and you can see uh, that that helped to bring down em emissions, particularly that um, methane emissions wedge is much smaller uh, as well as the the F gases wedge down to 3.3 degrees. Thank you, world governments, for that for that proposal um, and for your actions on that front. Much appreciated. Um, so our uh, I think it's our last group um, is the climate hawks, the climate justice hawks, um, our civil society group. Uh, thank you for patiently waiting. What what is your proposal that you would like to see added? Hi, yeah, my name is Katie, and I represent a diverse group of citizens who are um, including the youth who have the most to lose with the high temperatures that are um, probably going to happen without reducing carbon dioxide emissions. And if we look at where we're at right now with our graphs, that big wedge of gray that uh, represents uh, carbon dioxide emissions from energy use has not gone down. And so we recommend reinstating that carbon price to at least $100 per ton and to um, include a dividend as that first group uh, talked about um, to take the economic um, hardship off of most people who um, would be hurt by a high energy cost. Um, and we agree that there's uh, energy efficiency improvements to be had and methane reduction to be had, but we are nibbling around the edges of this problem and we really need to address energy carbon dioxide emissions. Great. Thank you, Climate Hawks. So Climate Hawks are coming in and asking that, that we put that carbon price back in place that um, conventional energy had removed. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, and you see there the impact that reinstating that carbon price has in addition to the energy efficiency and all of the action we've taken on the non-CO2, those methane and other gases. Oh, let me replay that so you can just see that again. Um, so, as you note here, coal in particular coming down quite significantly, oil some, um, as well as more action to limit natural gas there. As over here, you see in particular this big gray wedge of energy CO2 emissions, it was going up. Now it uh, is peaking here around 2025 or so, and then uh, coming down and slowly reducing, sort of plateauing throughout the rest of the century. Thank you, Climate Hawks, for that um, proposal. And that concludes our first round. So we have made significant progress here. We started on a path towards 4.1 degrees, and now we're on a path towards 2.6 degrees. So, but is this enough? No, we're still, uh, 2.6 degrees can lead to all sorts of instability around our world, um, including sea level rise, as well as additional droughts. We must do everything we can to avoid um, temperatures of the, this high. Um, we will have a second round of negotiations at this point, um, and you all can reflect on where we're at. During the second round of negotiations, you, are, you will be welcome to leave your, your breakout room, come back to the main room, 
and a request to go to another breakout room. So you can talk with the other teams, um, try and figure out maybe there were some impasses that were revealed themselves in the previous round that you all can sort through um, and navigate and so that we can come up with a, a better plan of action uh, that can really take, take the su su sufficient level uh, of, of steps we need to take to address this crisis. Um, I will also note one thing before we switch uh, that I will highlight. I'm going to switch, go back to the graphs, and I'm going to show you all. Um, let me see, not that, those graphs. I'm going to show you all just to, to keep things in perspective of where we sit currently in terms of our scenario. So this graph I'm showing on the right is all of the carbon dioxide emissions and the carbon dioxide uh, uh, removals. So in our world, and you can think of this, uh, let me use the analogy of a bathtub. So think about a bathtub. There are two major components of the, uh, three major components of the bathtub. First, there's the faucet or the tap where the water comes into the bathtub. Think of that as like emissions. Then there is the drain in the bathtub uh, where all of the water goes out. This is our, our think of this as removals. And then the level of water in the container of the bathtub, that's the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. So what does it take, if we have a bathtub, what does it take to lower the level of a bathtub? Well, for one, you should make sure that your tap is tightened down so that there's not more water going in. So Think about that side of the CO2 emissions going in. Right here, you can see that currently, here in the year 2020, there is about twice as much going into our atmosphere as is being removed. That's significant. And that's leading to the accumulation of lots of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, which is leading to all of the warming, uh, much of the warming that we see. Then, on the other hand, another way you can change the level of a bathtub is by opening up the drain. Uh, you can, you know, maybe if you have, your drain is clogged, you can clean it out, open it up even more. Um, and that is the removals. So uh, delegates, I, I encourage you to kind of keep that in mind as you think about the dynamics we are facing moving forward with your uh, proposals. And once again, you can uh, leave your breakout rooms and go meet with other teams. We encourage that. Um, and we can, we will want, want to help you facilitate uh, help facilitate these negotiations as best as possible so that we can come up with the best possible agreement. I see it's a, it's a um, quarter after where I am. Um, so why don't we take, uh, we'll probably go until half past, a little more than half past uh, to uh, take on these negotiations. Caroline, can you open back up the negotiating rooms for everyone? Yes. So everyone should be being prompted to join their breakout rooms. A carbon, uh, a, a carbon tax scheme on that. So we wanted to see uh, what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, Andrew, let me hear from on to that. Um, what I'm hearing is uh, that you have a concern for uh, equity uh, with a level playing field. And, and we certainly agree uh, that that's important. Um, what I might point out is that the fossil fuel industry has given everybody uh, a far greater standard of living than we would have had without it. And so our concern for a level playing field is that we don't uh, step back from the standard of living that we have and we would accept um, a, a certain level of carbon tax, much smaller than the climate hawks propose. Um, but what we would like to see is, and we're prepared to make investment in carbon capture and storage technology, which will allow us to continue to produce fossil fuels that are far cleaner than they are today. And there's one more issue that is important. You are from, from the world governments, right? Yes. So, you know, um, 
if carbon tax is as high as they proposed, we're not going to have so much money to put into lobbying and to making your lives as politicians so much easier, so much comfortable. So you need to take that in, into account as well. Okay. Well, this is, uh, this is useful. Uh, you know, we all uh, are citizens of the same atmosphere and we all have the same problem here. And there are costs that never hit the bottom line of conventional energy. We understand that. And would you agree then that we, uh, to, uh, if we uh, stop, at least stop subsidizing fossil fuels so that we can make cleaner renewable energies at least a, a little more competitive? Because there's the last estimate I saw was uh, worldwide six and a half uh, trillion dollars of subsidies flowing into the fossil fuel industries. So can we level the playing field by eliminating subsidies for fossil fuel development? So that we, and, and why don't you guys get into more investment in clean energy, uh, not just capturing the pollution that comes from carbon, but invest in clean energy and make that part of your energy portfolio your energy companies. So can we, can we stop uh, subsidizing at least, put the modest tax on, and then, uh, and then uh, encourage you to diversify? You know, Andrew, I, I can understand uh, people uh, who might propose uh, things such as that, but in the corporate world, what a lot of people do not appreciate is that uh, the board of directors of a fossil fuel companies have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize the return for their shareholders. And so we have to be very careful and take that responsibility uh, very seriously uh, as we, uh, uh, you know, all work together to try to get to this uh, sustainable future that we all want. I agree. Um, okay, well, very good. I appreciate your uh, your thoughts on that, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll bring that uh, your your messaging back to the world governments. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, Ron. If what you want is money, we can arrange uh, some money for you for, uh, from <laughs> carbon pricing. Um, but get you out of uh, the fossil industry and help you reconvert your your companies to more sustainable companies. Well, which group what, are you uh, from? Fossil fuel is, is destroying our, 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 our atmosphere. So we can help you uh, 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 transform yourself into a more sustainable company. That is Eduardo, you, which, which group are you from? I'm, a I'm from uh, the, the Climate Cox. Climate Hawks. Uh, uh, um, so, uh, I'm, that's it. I'm, I'm here with that. How do you transform your industry to something that's sustainable? Okay, so you need to understand that we, we can, um, if you don't choke us with carbon tax, we can put a lot of money into CCS and into a lot of other fields that will make the, will we'll take CO2, a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere. But we, 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 we are powerless if, if we don't have, if the price of energy goes up that high. You well, uh, thank you for your comment. Um, but we don't reach the two degrees with uh, that policy. That's the issue for- Yes, we can. <laughs> we're offering to transform your industries to keep your jobs and your money with you, but if you want money, we can give you money. That's the issue. If the issue is money, but you, what you're doing is hurting our, our people, people around the world. That's the issue, I, don't, I think. I don't think you, you have a clue how much money we're talking about. <laughs> well, name me. Where is the money well, name coming me, then from? We start thinking about money, which is the real issue. If we don't speak about the real issue, we will not solve the problem. But it, because what, what you really want is money, we can arrange for you for having money. We can How print much money? It. 
How much money are you going to give us? No, no, you, st you state your number. You're not going to. <laughs> you're very clever. You, you must say your numbers. Or present you're the one who's them, offering. So our you're the one who's offering. Go over them and give you and give you an answer. You're the one <laughs> who's offering. But you have to stay, stay your money. But the issue is money, not uh, conventional fuels. And good jobs for people, for your people. So your CEOs can okay. get their yeah, their packets and, and and so on. But we have to solve this issue because otherwise we will don't have any any place to enjoy money. We will not have a place to go outside and, 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 and <laughs> go to the Eduardo, beach. And so. you Eduardo, have a Eduardo, let me tell you, I, I hosted uh, a game like this and we reached the target of, of 1.7 degrees without carbon tax. It's possible. Hi, I've joined you. Hello. How are you? Hi, where are you from? Uh, well, I am from the Conventional Energy Group, and I think you've sent a person to go meet in that group. <laughs> perhaps. Very good. We met each other in the hallway, so to speak. <laughs> Great. But we're here to talk a little bit about the carbon tax and your proposal. And uh, one of my questions is, um, in your considerations, have you looked at carbon sequestration? Yes. And what were your conclusions? Well, it's a great uh, way to take some carbon out of uh, the atmosphere, but certainly not enough to actually lower the quantity of carbon dioxide emissions that we put into the atmosphere. It is, it is a help. It's just not mm -hmm. a full solution. Mm -hmm. No, no, and we know it's silver buckshot because we've all done the training. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so what about if we're thinking about you know the compounded effect of these levers moving? And we looked at because the lever never got moved on applying new technology and the action of sequestering the carbon from energy production so that we don't compound the problem that we're addressing that problem head on. So if we increase the new technology level and address carbon additions through that me uh, mitigation process, we could possibly have also an effect if we reduce the carbon tax. The problem is the amount of that tax is going to put some of what we could put into technology and research that would benefit a global aspect and address carbon needs and energy sources for the smaller countries who are dependent on coal being such a heavy, heavy carbon producing, producing energy source. So we're looking at it at two ends. Is that yes, a carbon tax is going to ultimately be necessary, but $100 a ton is not feasible when we're still trying to address that new technology of creating a sustainable energy source itself in the process of turning over technology. So um, what we're looking at is possibly a consideration of lowering the carbon tax to start at $20 per ton. And you could have an incremental rise every 10 years, mm -hmm. maxing out at $45 a ton or maxing out at $60 a ton but also then having that lever. So if we put in to the, to the mix, moving that lever up for carbon sequestration, the carbon collection of the energy source, at the same time applying a reduced tax at $20 a ton, and then you can put in for that incremental rise. Would you, would you consider uh, starting at $20 a ton and, and, and letting it go up uh, uh, yearly uh, and uh, get to 100 or 150 dollars a ton eventually. Would, would you be able to accommodate, you know, the the, uh, the grid by by more a gradual, a more gradual, uh, but but a high, ultimately higher level of carbon tax? Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Now, you say yearly an increase? Well, I think we might be getting ahead of ourselves on figuring out uh, dollars here. Um, I think you're right that certain developing countries who are dependent on coal uh, right now and who may not have the ability and the capital to switch uh, and a high carbon price on them would disproportionately affect their ability to move forward with new sources Mm -hmm. of energy. And so this might be where globally we need to look at developed countries providing uh, help to developing countries uh, to get right to renewable sources of energy to reduce that, those carbon emissions. Uh, new technology sounds great. It takes a long time. We don't know exactly what that means. Uh, if it's a brand new technology, it takes time to build it, produce it, test it, and put it on up to scale. So I think mm-hmm. we need to, to look at uh, some solutions that are doable in the near term. Um, and taxes on carbon uh, might not have to be the same globally. Uh, we in the developed world use much more energy and um, can probably afford a higher price on our energy, especially with replace you know dividends back so i think we need to look at all of these things um, and not worry about specifically those prices per se Mm -hmm. this round well and well what has happened in the first round was the price was set and that high price although had a magnificent output totally halts the effort of even those developed countries putting the money into the technology to help the smaller countries because all of our money is going into paying that tax. So by reducing the tax, it's going to take that lever to come off a bit so that we can add the lever of the technology because the new, the developed countries have the capacity to do that technology and that development level that would benefit a global uh, energy need. So working and putting investments in that form has a high dividend payoff as well as um, allowing them to have the, the flexibility to use their money that way rather than encumbering the whole paying of the tax, which doesn't benefit the global scale of advancement. So that that lever of the tax amount does have to be addressed at the same time the other levers are moved. And some of those levers could include consideration of the source of those energies so that more emphasis is put on the lower carbons, developing those renewable or the biofuels or the lower carbon emitting natural gas as opposed to the oil and to the uh, coal industry. So yeah, that's a consideration that can be, you know, balanced and and detailed out. But the big step has to be at looking at what is that price you're setting that carbon tax at. Mm -hmm. And right now, $100 per ton is just too too expensive for us to even address putting our funding in any other sources. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I agree that to um, take into account the ability to move forward with other sources of energy. Um, We also need to look at job creation and the economic impacts to governments who are so dependent on fossil fuel energy. So that's why uh, globally we need these negotiations to Mm -hmm. um, move money from you know, high energy, uh, billions and trillions of dollars of of uh, profit to some of these uh, companies and put that towards what's best for society and not just to the private companies that are gaining. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, reading the blue tab. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I would agree that, uh, that if if we certainly be flexible in terms of, of of a lower tax, but we want to be a progressive tax. We, we would we would feel strong strongly about that. You know. Well, what would be your lower tax amount? We could start off fifteen dollars a ton. Yeah, I think we need to. I'm sorry. What was that? We, we could start off at fifteen dollars a ton. Fifteen, one five. Or 50. 15? We start off at 15. It's just that we're, 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 we're going to increase it the increment fairly rapidly. We've only got, you know, a, a few years to, to get to 50% of, of, of the carbon reduction that we, we're doing now. And, and so mm -hmm. time is limited. So we're going to have to, we're going to have to be, it's going to have to be progressive. Okay. Well, we could do the progressing. And um, so if you're willing to start at the 15 level, uh, and I don't know how fast you're looking at progressing it, but we'd be looking at applying that money rather than just seeing it as you know, the clear profit is taking that and putting it into the new technology development and turnover so that we can start building less carbon impacts and uh, sharing that with other nations. So, but I think I have to get back to the other room and let them know what we've talked about. <laughs> okay. no. Welcome back, delegates. I was able to peer into some of the negotiation rooms and I saw some quite heated discussions at foot. I hope. Uh, that we were able to resolve some of the differences, although I fear that some of our differences might have just been made more apparent. And uh, we will see whether this next round uh, bears any of that out and whether we will be able to reconcile some of the conflicts that we saw play out in the first round where uh, things in particular like the carbon price were a very hot topic that were implemented and then removed and then re-implemented. Um, I don't know what will come of that in this next round, um, but thank you and welcome back. Um, let's have uh, each group again have us what have one speaker to present their proposal, and then we will go from here. And I think again I will start with the um, clean energy group. So you all. Um, had come out initially with your your policy last time, and then saw it removed. Uh, let's let's go back to you all and hear where you all sit right now. Okay, this is this is Greg Haugen. Uh, we're uh, we're still feel very strongly there needs to be a price on carbon because clean tech actually believes there ought to be a level playing field for for our technology for. For solar panels, for for wind, and in order to get a level playing field, we need to put a price on pollution that's being uh, that's been causing a causing costs to everybody throughout the world. And by putting a price on carbon, it puts a price on carbon pollution that the fossil fuel is uh, emitting, and that helps maintain the uh, at, at a level playing field. Now, as far as uh, other activities that we ought to do, we need to uh, look at energy efficiency, and uh, especially energy efficiency in transport. And we ought to be putting effort into increasing the energy efficiency, just like we put it, just like we increased the efficiency of buildings and industry in the last round. We think the energy efficiency of transport is a, a very important place for us to invest in and in, in getting uh, improvements. Great, uh, thanks, uh, Clean Tech. So, what I heard there is that you remain in support of a carbon price and would like to see additional uh, efforts taken to improve the energy efficiency in our transport sector. So, that is one area we haven't touched yet, our transportation sector. I am going to move that up again. Uh, let's go look at our energy consumption graph here. So it's kind of it's plateaued some, uh, in particular from the impacts of our initial energy efficiency, as well as some from that carbon price. 
um, as I increase how efficient our cars, our trucks, our trains are. Watch what happens to that energy consumption. It begins to peak and then actually curve down some. And then you can also note the uh, change in temperature as that uh, energy CO2 wedge there becomes just that much more narrow um, with those efforts. Thank you so much for um, that contribution, Clean Tech. Why don't we keep moving and uh, turn over to the land, agriculture, and forestry uh, group. Where did you all land in your negotiations here in the second round? Uh, thank you. This is Andrew on behalf of the uh, Land and Ag uh, Consortium. Uh, first, we commend our negotiating partners for the efforts thus far. Um, we discussed a number of policy proposals. Ultimately, we'd like to also stay within uh, the transport sector. Uh, we'd like to further accelerate the trends towards electrification. Um, we'd really like to encourage the possibilities of electric trucking, right, on, on which our industry would rely. Um, encouraging that momentum over time really is a means to obviously decarbonize a, a difficult to, to decarbonize sector and reduce, uh, further reduce demand for oil. Uh, we thought of this in terms of a post-COVID economic stimulus, right? We thought about modeling after the German package, which would send people back to work, um, largely focused on the right sorts of things, building electric infrastructure. Uh, that package had $145 billion without a dollar uh, for combustion engine vehicles. Um, it, it includes heavy investment in, in transport electrification. Uh, we discussed this as a possibility uh, in Kenya, in Iran, where two, two members of our constituency are based. And we thought of the, uh, you know, the multi-solving, the co-benefits of cleaner air, of jobs, um, of coming out of the COVID crisis globally uh, the right way. So we'd like to see a, you know, a 3% improvement per annum in uh, the acceleration of electrification. Great, thank you uh, for that. Off our land, agriculture and forestry, um, I'm gonna increase this to 3% and um, watch what happens as we do this. So you see here, uh, for one, this graph on the lower right hand side here is showing the electrification really taking off uh, in the next couple decades and going to where by the end of the century, 70% of our transportation fleet is, is running on electric. Uh, there are lots of difficult things to electrify, uh, things like airplanes and long range shipping uh, provoke currently pose some technological barriers to electrification, but there is lots of um, potential in things like uh, family vehicles and trains and uh, city buses and all of those kinds of things that can be electrified uh, today. Um, so let me replay the change so you can see it one more time. Uh, first off, just really note what happens here to this red line of oil. That's what I'm noticing the most. Here, so as we electrify, it means uh, currently. So prior to us uh, implementing this electrification policy, oil remained high. It's because we're so darn dependent on it uh, for our transportation sector. But as we can move our transportation sector to be powered by other things, uh, renewable energy here, but then also the other remaining sources of electricity, uh, that that oil demand then goes down. Um, so there you can see that red line, uh, particularly in the later half of the century, really um, coming down much more and renewables boosting because uh, there's more demand on our electrical grid. Thank you very much, uh, land, agriculture, and forestry. I'm going to turn now to our conventional energy group. I was able to peer into their negotiating room and saw some quite heated negotiations as uh, members of other groups were, were uh, reaching out to them. Conventional energy, where did you all land with that? And uh, what is your, your proposal for the next step here? Yeah, I think I can speak for the conventional energy consortium. Um, and what I'd like to say is that uh, we heard from climate hawks and we heard from world government and uh, we've taken their concerns very seriously. Um, bearing in mind our fiduciary responsibility uh, to our stockholders to um, keep our businesses viable and also bearing in mind the fact that uh, the lifestyle and energy that we all depend on today is based on fossil fuels. So we have to proceed carefully. And we're willing to concede that a carbon tax 
has benefits. If it was a low, lower figure, uh, our consortium would have uh, more money and resources uh, without trying to absorb that carbon tax uh, or pass it on to consumers. On to consumers. And we would like to suggest uh, investment in carbon capture and storage as one solution. And we're also willing to put electric, electrification of transportation by providing um, charging stations at many of our uh, current uh, gas station uh, outlets that uh, provide fossil fuels. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you, Conventional Energy. So just to recap, what were the, what is the one policy that you would like to see us address here? Well, it's, it's really two. We agree to a carbon tax at the level of $30 a ton. So we're agreeing to a previous policy and our new policy is investment in new technology, specifically carbon capture and storage for fossil fuel. Uh, sources. Okay, and let me just remind you, conventional energy, of, of the, the rules of these negotiations. You can only make one move uh, each round. So mm. what I heard, though, is that um, you have, you are okay with a $30 carbon, dollar a ton carbon price. So I will move the $100 carbon price down to $30 as uh, where conventional energy is okay with it sitting. Um, and let's see what the impact then of that will be. So here we are at $30 a ton. Uh, and let me replay that change so you all can catch that. So we were at 2.4, uh, now we are at 2.8 uh, with that more modest carbon price of $30 a ton. Um, and I heard mention things like carbon capture and storage, um, so CCS, so this is, a poly, this is a type of technology that, um, that could be implemented on fossil fuel facilities and also bioenergy, um, energy production facilities where it would capture the emissions that they produce and then store it permanently underground. And that is what I hear conventional energy. That $30 carbon price does kind of lead to some of this. You see this dark gray wedge here is uh, some of these coal plants here in the later half of the century are getting some of that um, carbon capture and storage technology applied to it. Uh, there, are, of course, could be questions about whether that is uh, desired, but there it is. Um, okay, well, I guess, thank you, Conventional Energy. We, were, uh, we are doing better than we were last round when you went, but uh, still have some ways to go. Let's see what our next group might offer. Um, industry and Commerce. Where did you all land with your negotiations? Yes, well, thank you. We're uh, gratified to see that uh, the increased efficiency in transportation has already been acted on. We can see that our constituency will greatly benefit from more affordable distribution costs, and we'll be able to pass that on to the end consumers. Um, our second choice would be increased electrification of buildings and industry. We think that that has a lot of benefits for our community and um, because it allows the providers of energy to have flexibility it allows us to take advantage of whatever other changes are happening in the energy landscape in the coming decades great thank you um, industry and commerce for that so i'm going to scale up the electrification of buildings and industry and think about what happened when i did this for uh, the transportation sector what do you think might happen here similarly when we move away from things like uh, heating homes or uh, water heaters with natural gas or cooking with natural gas, moving towards electric uh, resistance heat and electric stoves, also uh, turning over furnaces and industrial facilities so that they're not powered by fossil fuels directly, but are electric and then can then be powered by the, uh, the, the sources of electrical generation that we have here. I'm gonna scale this up. So as you see this adjust, uh, we'll move it all the way up to say 4% per year. Um, so let me replay that change. So again, note what's going on with oil here, but really what it stands out most to me 
uh, as we're replaying the change is this renewables line going up more and more. And so what's going on here is that we just have more demand for electrical energy uh, because these uh, these sources, uh, all, all of this, all this stuff in buildings and industry are now powered by um, electrical sources, which could include uh, coal and gas, but how? But they're pretty, they're limited because of that carbon price. Um, so renewables is particularly in the later half of the century is really coming on board and becoming the dominant source of energy. Um, so that does help some uh, lowers our temperature a little bit. Um, why don't we keep moving uh, to world governments? World governments, I know you were talking to conventional energy. I don't know what came of that or whether you got a chance to talk to other groups as well. Um, what is the proposal that you all have world governments? Well, we, uh, uh, we made some progress and appreciate the, uh, um, the conventional energy industry to agree to uh, um, at least some carbon tax. Um, and appreciate uh, that movement there. Um, we what, one of the things we discussed is the the, the incredible amount of, of uh, subsidi subsidization that the fossil fuel companies get worldwide, and uh, we think that this this carbon tax uh, does not go far enough to level the playing field to make renewable energy more competitive against the, uh, the extreme amount of subsidies that are going to fossil fuels. So what we would recommend is that we maximize the uh, uh, amount of renewable energy subsidies that are available uh, uh, and, and encourage renewable energy subsidies at least to the level of 10 percent or um, uh, and uh, that will now that we've electrified uh, transport and uh, and 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 uh, industry more. It should give a, a home to more renewable, more subsidized renewable energy, and help create a more even playing field for growth of renewable energy. Now, let me let me just say one thing that that every every million dollars invested in in solar creates 13 jobs. Uh, and, and, and every uh, million dollars invested in wind creates about 14 jobs. Having your uh, coffee still? And it, so it, I'd like to just uh, uh, say that this, this, this helps everybody because it creates far more jobs when we, when we invest in renewable energy than it does in the fossil fuel industry. So that would be our okay. recommendation. Thank you, world government. So world government's calling for a maximum subsidy in renewable energy. I presume they will pr procure and provide that financing uh, to see what uh, we, we can do if we really scale up their, our subsidy in renewable energy. So again, let me replay that change. This is where we were in terms of renewables and we've nearly doubled it. Uh, to so there's double the amount of renewable energy by the end of the century that we would have had otherwise. That also helps further suppress down that coal and that gas. Although that coal and gas is still used, uh, there's not a lot stopping it. Uh, we have a modest carbon price that limits some of that use, but the fossil fuels are still around to some extent, although by the end of the century, lots of wind and solar out there. It's, it's, uh, just to, just also a reminder to put yourself on mute uh, if you're if you're not speaking. Um, thanks. And then also notice here on the right. So uh, our energy CO2 emissions, this gray wedge, now peaking and then steadily falling throughout the century. We're at 2.5 degrees. Um, I'm going to turn now to our climate hawks. Um, climate hawks. Um, looking at the state of our scenario here. Um, I'm curious how you're feeling about things and uh, what you think we, sh we might do next. Well, um, I'm, I'm with the Climate Hawks group and uh, we were talking with um, the um, current energy uh, group, what do they call the uh, industry and commerce group. And we are very happy to see that they're willing to take a, a smaller a carbon fee, let that be applied, because as we can see from the simulator here, carbon price really does affect 
the the end game here in 2100 is getting this to, to closer to two degrees. Um, so we are concerned with that. We also um, didn't reach an agreement, but we had talked to to them uh, about um, getting some golden bridge because they are energy companies, how they can help use the energy technology they already have to produce non-carbon based energies. So maybe we could work a little bit more on that too. Uh, transition them to clean energy sources. Great. So, Climate Hawks, just to restate, what is the what's the one policy that you would like to see us move here uh, in our portfolio of of actions right now? Well, I think another group has already done it with the carbon price, putting it back on, and we would like to keep working with them to to increase the carbon price. Uh, they, I think, um, an agreement was reached at thirty dollars per ton. But yeah, that's can, that's uh, where it is right now. Yeah, maybe we can increase that uh, faster. Maybe yeah, so start, we could you know, maybe uh, maybe you know even you know smaller in the beginning and then uh, ramping it up to help. Okay. So what I'm hearing from the um, climate justice hawks is that they're okay with this thirty dollar a ton carbon price, but would like to see it rise uh, in a second phase to right. go up even higher. Um, right. So let's say that um, that we do that. Um, so this will take a couple le levers. So I'm going to say maybe the final carbon price uh, will might be 150 is what um, yeah. the climate hawks are proposing. And then that will we will start implementing in that uh, second phase uh, in say um, maybe 2035, uh, so 15 years after the start of our $30 a ton carbon price. How about 10 years? T 10 years, okay. Um, uh, in 2030. Um, so there you can see um, that brings us down even further. So we've really pushed down our fossil fuels. I imagine our conventional energy group might have something to say about that new policy, but climate justice hawks, thank you very much for, uh, for, for proposing that and look at where our scenario sits right now. We're at 2.2 uh, degrees by the end of the century. This overshoots the Paris Agreement goal of limiting warming well below two, but we are in a much better world than we were previously. What I'm going to do at this point, um, we are running short on time in terms of how much negotiation space we have, but I am uh, just very curious whether there are groups um, that have uh, either you, you have an action that didn't get taken and you need it or you are unhappy with something as it currently sits and why don't you just um, raise your hand and then my uh, colleague here in the UN can look to our videos and let's see who, uh, I think I did just see a hand. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I don't, I can't see the names on people, but Caroline, can you call on someone? Yeah, um, um, I think Pauline was first. I'd like to see a big increase in afforestation. I know it's slow, but we're looking long range here and it could make a big difference in actually pulling the carbon out. And Pauline, remind us which group you are in. I'm in the world leaders group. World, so world, world government. government. World governments is, is suggesting that we take some action on forests, which uh, yeah, we haven't touched anything over in the forestry sector at this moment. So I will um, add in a big scale up of afforestation. The other thing this is doing is this is also in this department of carbon removal that we haven't touched yet either. Uh, if I replay this change, watch what happens here. There's this thin white line representing zero and this green is gonna appear below it uh, where it wasn't before. So as we replay this change, you see the impact that that makes. It brings down temperature a little bit um, but I, I saw a few other hands out there. Um, Caroline, who would be next? Um, uh, I think Barbara from Clean Tech. Barbara, yeah. What, what, what else? What is Clean Tech thinking here? Well, thank you so much. We think that technological carbon removal really needs to be leaned on hard. 
and actually that would be compatible with the conventional energy groups i would imagine because it uh because it doesn't directly affect them yeah um conventional energy are you supportive of a uh, of technological carbon removal too you want to see some of that let me see. Yeah, we we are supportive of that, Susan. Um, we see the big message there that it can pull significant amounts of carbon out of the atmosphere, and we're prepared to invest heavily in that technology. Okay, okay. So uh, thank you. I think that was, yeah, clean tech for that proposal. We seem to have some, uh, uh, some coalition building happening around this. Um, these new technologies in carbon re removal, um, of course, note that the industry around technological carbon removal is uh, currently very nascent. It doesn't exist at a large scale yet, but there's a lot of discussion around it. Um, so if we pour a lot of money and bet on it and it is successful, um, uh, then let's see what might happen. So I'm going to scale up our technological carbon removal here. And you see that does tip us over that two degree, to two degrees. So uh, that was uh, one significant action. And what's included here under technological carbon removal is a whole portfolio of different options. Some of them more likely than others, I would say. Um, included here is bioenergy carbon capture and storage, direct air capture, uh, enhanced mineralization, no-till agriculture, agricultural soil carbon, and biochar. Let me um, show you in the graphs um, these sources. So you can see all of the various different types there. And then that greenhouse gas net emissions by gas graph. You see this gray area that's appeared now. Um, so again, remember what I was talking about after the uh, the first round of negotiations, this, this analogy of a bathtub. So we, when we do our, um, when we implement something like technological carbon removal, what that is doing is uh, changing the, this blue line of CO2 removals, the drain aspect of, uh, of carbon dioxide. Let me replay the last change here. And uh, no, that... Yeah, and so there you can see that CO2 uh, removal line going, adjusting some. Um, so that is one action that got us below two degrees. I'm curious, was there another group out there who had their hand raised and wanted to jump in just really quick here in these final moments of negotiation to see where we can land? Um, yeah, Caroline, who else do you see? Uh, potentially Peter Garrett from Industry and Commerce. If he still has any ideas here. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. I do. I'm from the part of industry and commerce that is is very interested in seeing uh, the value of new technology. Um, as you are probably aware, electric vehicles, uh, although they were uh, some were invented many years ago, they've really only become available for us in the last ten or fifteen years, and Heat, <clears throat> um, heat pump technology, although it's been available in refrigerators, as far as heat pumps that'll heat and cool your homes have only been available very recently. So I'm looking for new technology to, be, to, um, uh, to come along big time. Uh, and but that should definitely please the conventional energy people. As they, as they make a transition out of their um, kind of steady state thinking. Um, so. Hmm. Okay, so a proposal here to try this um, additional uh, new technology. So this would be some new energy supply source that uh, is currently not at scale currently. Uh, it could be something that's in the lab, you know, uh, we oftentimes see headlines about maybe the potential of a breakthrough in thorium-based nuclear fission or something like that could come along. Maybe it's something we haven't thought of yet, um, but uh, Peter from Industry and Commerce advocating that uh, new technologies do come along and we should, uh, maybe something like that could, could enter in. So as I adjust this, notice what happens here. This orange uh, line that is currently non-existent will rise up 
And you can see even with a huge breakthrough there, let me replay that change and notice what just happened. Um, there it goes. So uh, there it comes up. And uh, the temperature change isn't, isn't, isn't huge there. Um, and I will note, one of the things that's going on is that we have a whole lot of renewables. That, that big subsidy we placed on renewables made renewable energy uh, the dominant energy source in our landscape. And so that's already clean energy. The new technology comes in and it's competing with those renewables. This, this might be... Um, I, it might be okay. We need to have a variety of different energy sources out there. Maybe there are reasons to not entirely count on uh, our renewable sector uh, with some, some additional clean energy. But uh, notice that's not why we see this, uh, an, addition, an additional big drop in our temperature change. The other thing to note about new technology, particularly as it applies to new sources of energy production, is that there are time delays. So if you look at this graph down here on the bottom right, this is the new technology demand. So our breakthrough occurred this year in 2020 on the new technology, but we don't really see it taking off until a couple decades. That's because there are delays in the commercialization. You know, once something exists, it has to scale up. We have to create those job training programs, hire all of the engineers, build the factories. Um, this can happen. Uh, and what we're estimating here with a huge breakthrough would be at an unprecedented speed uh, from which uh, that new technology emerges and then becomes to become a dominant source of energy in the world. Uh, so that, that is one thing there. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter from Industry and Commerce. Secretary General, there's yes. the, but there is something that I'd like to add to that, and that is that I was talking about all kinds of technology that use, hmm. uh, um, so you've got, uh, you actually only have a new technology slider in the energy supply, mm -hmm. but I was mentioning ev uh, electric vehicles, which are in Definitely. the new technology of the transport. I was talking about heat pumps, Definitely. which is the electrification of buildings and industry. And you also have a slider for technological innovation in carbon, the removal. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, I will note uh, that, that we have, it, that innovation is implied when we move these sliders. That, yes. will, that techn technological innovation will be absolutely essential for us to achieve transport electrification at this level. We need to figure out how to pioneer new vehicles and develop uh, all the different varieties of energy charging stations, as well as energy storage to account for our large diffusion of uh, of, of renewable energy technology here. So I will say um, technological innovation is inherent in uh, most of the slider moves that we have made today. I can't, I can't think of one in which uh, there is not some technological innovation that would be implied uh, by us taking action in that sector. Absolutely. Uh, great point. And I think that's a good place for us to stop for now. Um, so we did get below two degrees. So everyone, uh, give yourselves a round of applause. You know, congratulations, kudos to everyone. Uh, this is a much better future than we started with. Um, so remember, we were on that track towards 4.1 degrees. I talked at the beginning about the devastation that that could cause. Um, and I mean, let's be real here. Even with 1.8 degrees of warming, we're still going to see climate impacts. The goal here is for us to avoid those unmanageable impacts. Hopefully, we can manage, uh, we can create a, a manageable world here with these actions that we are taking here. Um, so at this point, I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can find my slides and we're gonna shift over into the debrief section. So one second here um, and I am going to uh, shake off my roll. Um, some of you all are, you know, might have changed your background. You can be back in your house. Uh, you can be who you are as your normal selves, not representing conventional energy. Shift out of the, those roles. Um, here, let me rename myself. I am Ellie again, no longer 
the Secretary General, um, hi everyone, let's see here, and um, let me stop sharing my screen for just a second. just navigating the Zoom interface. Okay. And uh, okay, back in my own house. Phew. Uh, it was nice to visit the UN General Assembly halls there, but uh, I am back. All right. So uh, let's just take a second and talk about this scenario that we created here. And let me go back and I'll share my screen. Um, so here's the scenario that we created, just as a recap of what we did here. Um, and actually, I'm going to grab the scenario link. I'm going to share it with you all, um, if I can get over to the chat. And here is our scenario coming in. You can check it out yourself. You can share it, um, uh, post it on the social media. If you're that kind of a person, that would be great. Um, so what we did here, so um, there is a big subsidy in renewable energy, as well as a breakthrough in new technology. Um, a small initial carbon price with it rising upwards towards um, $150 a ton by 2040. And then we have, we took action across energy efficiency uh, in the transport sector, as well as electrification. So this is a world with a lot more uh, electric cars, many more Teslas and all kinds of EVs from uh, Ford F-150 trucks on over to trains and buses and everything else, all, all, a lot of them powered by electricity. And I'm sure a lot of innovation occurring too to figure out how to, to electrify um, other more difficult things to electrify like planes. Um, we have seen some, some progress there uh, just in small breakthroughs recently. Um, buildings and industry, also lots of energy efficiency and electrification, that's pretty key. Um, and then one of the early things that you all took action on was this methane and other emissions sector. We really restricted those, uh, those gases that are not carbon dioxide. So our methane emissions, our nitrous oxide, and our F gases took a bunch of action there in the, those industrial and agricultural sectors to limit uh, the, those. That really helped a lot from the, at the beginning. And then uh, at the end there, we added some of the carbon removal um, policies as well. So take a minute. Think about this future that we just cre created collectively. Um, and we're going to take a minute of silence here. And I want you to think about what you would love about this particular future that we've generated or one similar to it. What are some of the aspects and qualities uh, to uh, this, this kind of a world that you would really love. And I'm gonna um, watch my watch here. So just take one minute silently, please. And uh, we'll share afterwards. All right, thanks. Um, would someone be willing to uh, raise their hand maybe and um, share um, something that came up for them? And Caroline, if you could help me again, call on someone if you see a hand either physically raised or the little digital way to raise it. 
Uh, Doug is uh, physically raising his hand. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Uh, what I'd like about it is clean, quiet streets with a lot of electric vehicles and uh, fewer noisy motors around with the electrification. Yeah. Cool. Someone else jump in after. We'll just try and popcorn it. So what I like is all of the um, social justice activism energy that's released from climate necessities and the way in which people can work for change in other more equitable domains rather than just fighting against oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. I like that, I like that there's uh, gonna be less air pollution if we go to more renewable resources of energy, better health outcomes, better healthier living for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yep. I like the idea of affordable energy coupled with clean air, better air quality. I'm There's a lot of jobs for engineers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm struck by um, there being at least the potential for a livable future for my grandchildren, even without yeah. my favorite the, uh, strongest lever, the carbon tax being pulled as hard as I thought it should be. So that gives me some hope. And I'm relieved that we nowadays have the technology, the computer, computing technology to all gather collectively because we are, I think, still few in numbers who, who uh, are frustrated and anxious uh, and would like to be a part of actual of developing actual solutions uh, to, to take this uh, process beyond the uh, awareness stage, which I think we all know is present in our hearts, and into the solutions development uh, stage. I think that's a very health giving and uh, uh, I inclusive, uh, socially just for. Uh, for people around the world. There are no uh, uh, national and geographic boundaries uh, through uh, Zoom technology and it allows people to sort of hold hands uh, around the world with each other and support each other. Yeah, thanks. So um, now that I'm not representing conventional energy any anymore, I would really like to see most of the energy in the world not generated by huge corporations, but by people putting solar farms, solar panels in their backyard and on the roofs and contributing to um, energy democracy. Wow. I'm still concerned about the huge power imbalance though. In this, in this simulation, Conventional energy seemed to be on a level playing field where they, where they aren't in reality. Mm. Yeah, we can we can talk some about some of those kinds of surprises and insights uh, in a second. Any other any other things anyone wanted to share about what you would love about this scenario? Sure, let, let me jump in, um, and I'm very glad not to be uh, wearing the conventional energy hat anymore. Um, <clears throat> and having lived for many years within a block of a very busy, very noisy H1 freeway here in Honolulu. Uh, the thing that I think I would love, two things that I would think I would love would be number one, quietness adjacent to heavy traffic areas and uh, clean air adjacent to heavy traffic areas and not having to deal with black carbon everywhere uh, you touch on the railing of your condominium. Um, and I think the other thing that hasn't been mentioned is new technology is almost there for self-driving uh, vehicles. And when self-driving becomes common, I think the goal is to reduce our highway deaths for, down from 40,000 a year in the US down to zero. And uh, as a transportation bike pedestrian advocate for many years, uh, I would just totally love to see that happen. 
Cool, thanks. I love the idea um, of the social change of values and our responsibility for taking care of the natural world. And um, I know we live in an economic world where profit is important, of course, but it would be nice to feel that the natural world gains in importance even, in, even though it's not counted in GDP. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Well, I would say let's wrap it up here. And I know that there may be others that didn't get a chance to share. Uh, thank you all who did share. That was pretty powerful to have those images of cleaner air and quieter freeways and m more positive social justice actions just happening as a result of, uh, of this kind of a world being created. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to also just step back a little bit and think about this, uh, this exercise and uh, the scenario we created. And I'm curious whether anyone has any reflections about things that surprise them. Um, you, some of you all alluded to your, uh, the fact that you were playing roles that you were not necessarily uh, ha happy in or, or necessarily uh, represented your personal beliefs, obviously. Um, any surprises that came up in, in the game and the, and the role playing or in our scenario? Um, and why don't we again do uh, raising hands? I'm gonna, um, Caroline, if you could help me again, just look for anyone with a raised hand. Um, we can yeah, I see uh, Tamara's hand is raised. Yeah, so one of the things that all the times that I've worked with the model, I've never seen us get below two degrees C with quite so little carbon tax, or I mean, or oil or gas uh, or, um, or coal tax. Um, it, it was just surprised me that we didn't really have to, I mean, we had to have a big carbon tax ultimately but not all the other individual taxes. I've never seen that scenario play out that way before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other surprises from anyone? I think uh, the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. <laughs> I, I think the subsidy on renewables, that high subsidy on renewables kind of helped a lot with that scenario. I can't remember how far that took us, but pretty big. Yeah, and let me see if I can pull it back up, our scenario, and, um, but yeah, that was significant, and it was, that was one of those things we did sort of there at the end, we hadn't touched those renewables, and then um, implemented that subsidy, so if I go back to our scenario and share the screen, um, you can see here, so one, uh, you know, again, looking back at our scenario and just saying like, okay, how much of a difference did that one thing make? So here's our renewables. If I remove it, um, you can see there that, you know, it makes some difference. Watch the, the interesting thing that happens here, if we don't have that renewable energy subsidy, that new technology that I'd added at the very end, uh, as Peter was talking about all kinds of different time, types of technological innovation, that new technology then uh, really is able to outcompete the renewables if without the subsidy. Um, so you can see there that our huge breakthrough in new technology um, then plays a role, but by itself, and maybe even if we didn't have that new technology, then uh, that plays a role too. So, so sometimes an interesting activity is just to remove different aspects that you've added in a scenario uh, to explore uh, what happens then as a result uh, to back, backtrack out of it. Good insight. Um, other surprises, someone else uh, with their um, hand. I was, I was surprised yeah. um, when uh, we went to the conventional energy room when they said no carbon tax, it was like, what? <laughs> and how do we get there? So I didn't think we could get uh, below two without a carbon tax either. So I was very surprised by uh, what you're showing now. But I also, uh, in the trade-off between new technology and renewables, the renewables technology has continued to improve particularly in the last 20 years. And I, I'm comfortable with that going up, but I'm not comfortable with the silver bullet of new technology will cure it all. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't see where it's going to develop that fast that 
we're going to achieve what we want by the, you know, middle of the century. Yeah, definitely. And you can, uh, that that's the power too of like, well, you know, maybe new technology is a hypothetical that won't come to fruition. What's then the well, impact? Some will, but it, I don't know that it's going to be so that it'll replace all renewables, you know? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, yeah, that, would, that would be my concern as well, that because uh, we're talking about a huge breakthrough, whether it's nuclear fusion or thorium fission, it's a monstrous change. And we've already included in this scenario a number of new technologies in the carbon mm -hmm. removal area. And as you said, Ellie, you know, none of those have gotten any kind of commercial traction yet. So this scenario depends on a huge breakthrough in new energy supply and quite a lot of new technology in carbon removal. Uh, and I'm not sure that's realistic. Whereas mm -hmm. on the renewable side, we know how to do energy production that's with renewables. Exactly. And then it's a matter of scale and efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good consideration to factor in as we think about the 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 numerous number of different sectors out there that need to uh, do very well to to create these kind of pathways. And there is a um, a quote that I really like from this woman uh, who has worked on fracking and is an author and scientist up in upstate New York here in the United States. She says uh, it's now time to play the Save the World Symphony. I don't know what instrument you need to play, but you need to find it and play it to the best of your ability. And, and I think about that oftentimes when we use inroads, we look across this whole suite of different actions and you all out there from Iran to Kenya to Hawaii to uh, High Point, North Carolina, to all these different places that you all are coming from, uh, you all have different, different windows into this world and uh, different things that you might be able to, to pull. I know some of you all are involved with uh, advocacy around carbon pricing, for example, and uh, taking action on all of those different things, finding that instrument and playing it to the best of your ability. Maybe it, maybe your instrument is, is inroads facilitation. You know, that could be one, one potential avenue there. Um, but that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a lot of different skill sets, which I think, you know, to my mind, it's also kind of good news in that regard because we have billions of people around the world and there's a lot of different skill sets if this was entirely relied on uh you know one one particular sector and they weren't taking action maybe we wouldn't be able to do it but maybe we can because uh there are a lot of different action happening out there um yeah, uh, 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 any other surprises or, or things? I'll take a few more and then uh, we'll keep moving on through this debrief. Elliot, yeah, Stuart. If I, I could comment about the uh, carbon tax issue. Um, and I understand uh, Yuval said they were able to get uh, below the temperature just by removing coal. The problem is that's not going to be a very equitable approach compared to a carbon fee and dividend. If you remove coal, um, then the cost of energy will rise. And that rise is going to negatively impact uh, those on the lower rung of the economic ladder. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas uh, a carbon fee and dividend approach helps to minimize that impact. Energy is going to go up, mm -hmm. period. And, New and technology. Sarah, what, what what was a surprise there for you um, that you were seeing? Or you were just kind of clarifying just, that point? Just a comment about the uh, carbon tax. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, personally, I don't believe there's a realistic approach unless there is a price on the pollution from using fossil fuels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think one, one of the things too that can be explored of, uh, while En-ROADS doesn't model like what might come, uh, like where a ref the revenue from a carbon price or from coal, oil, and gas taxes. I mean, there is revenue generated from taxes as well. The Those conversations about how those policies are implemented in an equitable way are absolutely important and, uh, and, and critical because we do have to think about, you know, um, Yuval, when he was playing conventional energy, mentioned the yellow vest protests in France and things like that, um, where policies to limit fossil fuel use were implemented in, in such a way that um, people felt like it hurt them. Um, so that's definitely an important consideration. Thanks, Stuart. 
Um, okay, let me check over to my slides. I see, uh, Katie, you're raising your hand. Why don't uh, you go ahead, Katie? I just wanted to make a comment about the simulation rather mm -hmm. than the solutions that surprised yeah. me. And yeah. that is that um, World Governments uh, Group supported that increase in subsidies to renewables and saying that there needed to be a level playing field with fossil fuels. But realistically, world governments that depend on uh, income from fossil fuels, you know, whether it be Russia, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, I mean, there's m lots of countries that do not want to switch over from fossil fuels. And I think this simulation um, went maybe easier than what would occur in a real world government negotiation. And not that it, it shouldn't happen, it just definitely should happen, but just saying, we're all kind of on the same page here. <laughs> Yeah, although we had some good, con our conventional energy, they were tough negotiators, it removed that carbon price yeah. twice <laughs> as it was <laughs> implemented and then removed and implemented and then removed. Yeah. All right, you all, um, thank you so much to the, the final crowd of you that has hung on for the three plus hours. Uh, what, a, what a great time to spend with you all uh, in, you know, in all of our different corner pockets of the world. Uh, again, just so appreciate everything you bring to this and uh, appreciate also, it's, 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 I'm really enjoying getting to know you all too and hearing from your, your insights and, and all of that as well. So thanks and uh, hope you have a good rest of your days and take care of yourselves, stay safe, wash your hands and all of that. Bye everyone.